Yeah. The chapter 17 still. Um, out of these three, which one do you think is the strongest? Phosphoric acid. Um, followed by ammonium. Yeah. Well, the, these two are a bit more tricky because ammonium is usually considered pretty weak. But then, you know, this this is a hydrogen oxalate ion. Uh, you would think this would be weak as well. But it's, you know, for this particular problem, you'd have access to the acid strength chart. So we can just read it off the chart, you know, which one's strongest and weakest. And so looking at the chart, wrong way, uh, we can see. And it's uh, from figure 17.6, which is the acid strength chart. It's phosphoric is first, and then hydrogen oxalate, and then ammonium. And so these two, you know, it would have been hard to, to figure out without the chart here. You know, I would have said the same thing. I probably would have went ammonium and then hydrogen oxalate as well. But if we have figure 17, 17, 6, then it's pretty easy to answer this. Um, figure 17.6 is this chart here. Uh, which is very similar to our chart that we had earlier from uh, chemical reactions. And so uh, phosphoric acid's here. Let me just go down the list. Ammonium's here, but hydrogen oxalate's here. And so hydrogen oxalate turns out to be stronger than ammonium. So. Now there's structural reasons we want to look into for that, but at this level we're just going to look chart. When we do acid-base reactions, these are Bronsted acid-base reactions. This is proton transfer reactions. Did we did we do one last time or look at one? <clears throat> so uh, this is a reaction. This is a kind of a confusing diagram, but this is the acid hydrogen sulfate reacting with the base hydroxide. So Hydrogen sulfate reacting with the base converts the base into water and the acid into sulfate. That's not normally the way I do it. The way we usually do it is just by equation. So, um, for example, hydrofluoric acid and sulfide ion, you know, I wouldn't make a diagram like we just saw. Uh, we would just do this like we did it in the first week. You know, what's the formula for hydrofluoric acid? HF. And then uh, sulfide ion? SO2, SO3. SO3. Yeah, sulfate's SO4, so sulfite's going to be SO3. Minus. Um, in, in this case, HF can only act as an acid, and sulfite can only act as a base. So we don't have any choices here. Sometimes we have a choice. It's amphoteric, but here. And then there's going to be water also present. That's the big difference um, between how we did it and how they do it here. We consider water because water is a potential reactant, but and since this isn't at that level, um, what are the products here? going to be. You're going to end up with fluoride and hydrogen sulfide ion. All right, then we do the conjugates. Doing the conjugates uh, means we go backwards here and we look. <coughs> um, so for example, chloride would be the base going backwards and hydrogen sulfide would be the acid going backwards. And then we rank these, you know, what's stronger, HF or hydrogen sulfide, and here we just look at the chart. So this is just a review. We did these type of reactions before. Oops. Uh, so looking at the chart, um, here's HF here. Hydrogen sulfide is here. So HF is considerably stronger. So we're going from stronger to weaker. And that means the bases should always be stronger to weaker as well. So we have driving force for this. That's an example of a Bronsted acid base reaction. Bronsted. Did I do an example of a Lewis acid base reaction? 
Did we do um, carbon dioxide and water? Yeah, Bronsted are going to be a lot easier. Bronsted are just these proton transfer reactions. So. A lot easier. Okay, whether it's a Lewis acid or a Bronsted acid, um, all the acids are going to, when mixed with water, are going to uh, change the pH of water. Same thing with bases. And so let's take a look at uh, pH uh, next. Um, for pH, we need to look at this uh, water equilibrium. Um, this is a dynamic equilibrium in which we have two waters collide. Uh, one water will be the base. Uh, the other water will be, let's say, the acid. I'll just draw. And so what do Bronsted bases do? Bronsted bases are proton, what do they say, proton removers. Or, you know, and so what, what's going to happen is this base is going to pull on this proton. It's going to try to take that proton. This is delta minus, that's delta plus. This electrical interaction that's happening there. Is water strong enough to pull a proton off of water? No. Really, you wouldn't think so, right? But um, at room temperature, do all water molecules move at the same speed? Are they moving in an identical fashion? No. What we're going to see at room temperature, they're going to be high energy water molecules and lower energy water molecules. In fact, we're going to see a distribution of energies. And um, if I had a billion water molecules, a small fraction of that will be pretty high energy. And so it turns out uh, out of a billion water molecules, there are about four that have enough energy to do this, to collide so violently that a reaction does take place. And the reaction is going to be a proton transfer or a Bronsted acid base reaction here, in which the water acting as a base will take a proton to form hydronium. And the water acting as the acid will lose a proton, forming hydroxide. Now, is, is this a favorable reaction? So here, this is our base. Going backwards, what's our base? Well, our base is going to be hydroxide. So what's a better base, hydroxide or water? Which one's a stronger base, hydroxide versus water? Hydroxide. Hydroxide is a much stronger base. And then this is our acid going forward. Our acid going backward will be hydronium. So what's a better acid, water or hydronium? Hydronium. And so what we say is there's no driving force. There's no driving force here because, you know, we're going up in energy. And so we're starting off in low energy and going up to high energy. Well, that's not favorable. We should, you know, if we we're going to roll, we should roll downhill, <laughs> not uphill. But it turns out in this mix of a billion water molecules, that are, there are four water molecules that can roll uphill. You know, just by sheer energy. Do they stay there forever? No, so if you have this violent collision, and let's say these two water molecules roll up the hill, up to high energy, you form these high energy mixture, hydronium and hydroxide. Well, what's gonna happen to the hydronium and hydroxide? They're going to react. Uh, strong acid, hydronium, strong base, hydroxide, this is a very favorable reaction with a good driving force. So immediately when we form these, these can react. They can react to form water. And so um, immediately when this is formed, uh, it can go back to water. But the thing is, can you turn off the collisions? Is there a button that you can push that prevents the water molecules from moving? No. You can't turn off the collision, so what, what happens is that two more water molecules collide and remake this. And then these react and go back to this. And eventually we hit this point where the water molecules are colliding 
just as fast as these two are neutralizing each other out. In other words, the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. And when that happens, we generate a steady concentration of this because it's being produced as fast as it's being consumed, so we're going to have a steady concentration. Well, what is that steady concentration? That steady concentration is very low, you know? And so um, we call that at equilibrium. And this is at 25 degrees C. The concentration of this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And the concentration of the hydroxide is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. And so we just make um, a very, very small concentration. It's a very, very small concentration because you know this is going uphill quite steeply. And so just a few molecules can exist up there. Or not molecules, but ions. These are ions. <laughs> um, this is a, a steady or a constant concentration. This is called the dynamic equilibrium because it's just circling, going in circles. Well, it turns out that um, that is a very steady concentration. In fact, if we look at the um, hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, um, that's going to equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So it's 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the minus 7 gives us 10 to the minus 14. And this is equal to a constant. And this constant we call Kw. Kw is the water autoionization constant, or it's the water constant, Kw. And this is what it's equal to. So maintain so. That's in pure water. So that's what we see here at 25 degrees C. But it turns out, not just pure water, but all solutions, all other solutions obey this. Maintain this constant. So in acid solutions, what happens in acid solutions where we have a lot of hydronium in there. And so if we have an acid solution, what happens is um, this. The hydronium increases in an acid solution, which means the hydroxide must decrease. But if it's an acid solution, you'd expect there should be no hydroxide. Hydroxide is a strong base. Why would there be strong base in an acid solution? And it turns out, in all acid solutions, there's going to be some hydroxide. But where does the hydroxide come from? Does the hydroxide come from the acid that you're adding to the water? No, the, the hydroxide comes from the water molecules themselves colliding. And so there's no way to get rid of that. You're always going to be having a little bit of um, hydroxide in all acid solutions. So here's the reaction here. And therefore, um, <coughs> therefore, we have this way of defining what an acid is. An acid solution is one in which the hydronium, or H plus, is greater than the hydroxide. A neutral solution is when the hydronium equals the hydroxide. A base solution is when we have more hydroxide than hydronium. But we're going to have both of these present at all times in water. So what we're going to look at next is um, the, here they're just doing this little calculation for figuring out. I mean, if we know Kw, then we can figure out what these individual concentrations are. But that's how Kw was derived. Kw was derived from measuring these concentrations and then calculating it. It's going backwards. That's how it's derived. All right, um, so let's do this. Uh, this Kw constant holds for all solutions. So determine the hydroxide ion concentration in a solution in which the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 5 molar. So we have just some, some solution. Uh, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the minus 5 molar. Hydrogen ion, H plus, and hydronium are the same thing, basically. 
So I'll just write it as hydronium. This is equal to 10 to the minus 5 molar. Well, we know that Kw holds. Kw is a constant, which equals 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. And this is going to equal the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. And therefore, the hydronium ion concentration um, is equal to this, and we're solving for the hydroxide. Let's do that. And that's just going to equal Kw divided by the hydronium ion concentration. So plugging in the numbers here, um, this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. This is 10 to the minus 5. So um, the units are going to be molar here. Interestingly, these have no units. But the concentrations do have a unit. The concentrations are given by these square brackets here. That's molar here. And so this is just going to equal 10 to the minus 9 molar hydroxide. So this has both acid and base. It has uh, hydronium and hydroxide, as all solutions do. And so we just have to look, which one do we have more of? Do we have more hydronium or more hydroxide? Can you see? We have more hydronium. Um, you know, the hydronium is 10 to the minus 5, hydroxide is 10 to the minus 9, so it's more acid than base, so this would be considered acid. Now all the hydroxide in the acid solution comes from water, collisions with water. Let's um, look at some other here. When we um, <coughs> when we look at that, the hydronium and hydroxide concentration, there are other ways of expressing this concentration. Um, one way of expressing the concentration is by a power function. And so, in, in general, power function is just P and then. Q. Q is some function, any function, and it's defined as the uh, negative log of, of whatever function we're looking at, Q, or whatever quantity we're looking at. And therefore, pH is equal to the negative log of the H plus, or the hydronium. The pOH is equal to the negative log of the hydroxide. And there's another one we can do, pKW, which would be the negative log of uh, KW. Kw is a constant at 25 degrees C, so this is equal to 14.00 at 25 degrees C. And so another way of thinking about power functions, power functions are the negative of the power. And so Kw, um, what is Kw? Well, Kw is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So if we look at this, here's the power. The power is minus 14. And so the power function is the negative of the power. So it's negative times negative, which gives us a positive 14. <coughs> In fact, um, with these relationships, what we can do is we can take the anti-logs as well. And we can summarize this in, in a chart like this. If I look at this chart, I'm going to just copy it. Is we have H plus here, and we can relate this to OH minus. H plus and OH minus can be related by KW. KW is equal to the H plus concentration times the OH minus concentration, or the hydronium concentration times the hydroxide concentration. And so this would be similar to the calculation we had just done earlier. And the H plus can also be related to the pH, the power of the hydron, hydrogen ion concentration. And that is the pH is equal to the 
negative log of the H plus situation. We can go backwards here as well if we take the anti log. And so um, if I'm given the pH and I want to figure out the H plus concentration, then I'll just take the, this. The H plus concentration is the anti log, this is log base 10, so it would be 10 to the minus pH molar. We can go from pH to pOH, the power of the hydroxide ion concentration. The pH to pOH relationship is given by pKW. pKW is equal to 14.00, which equals the pH plus the pOH using the property of log. And so the, the combination of the pH and the pOH has to equal 14 at 25 degrees. And then we have these down here. Uh, if we want the pOH, if we go left to right, the pOH is equal to the negative log of the OH minus concentration. If we want the OH minus concentration, that's going to be the anti log 10 to the minus pOH R. So this will allow us to um, interconvert between those here. So when we look at the pH, um, this is a significance. And so in pure water, what is the concentration of H plus? In pure water, the concentration of H plus is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 molar. <coughs> 10 to the minus 7, well, minus 7 is the power. And so in pure water, we take the negative of the power, it gives us 7. So the pH is 7 in pure water. So that's what we call neutral. In acidic solutions, we'll see that the pH is going to be less than 7. In basic solutions, the pH is going to be greater than 7. And the pH and the pOH have a seesaw relationship. If one goes up, the other goes down. The pH and the pOH have to add up to 14. And so let's uh, do this problem here. What are the pH? pOH, hydroxide, and hydrogen ion concentration of 0.01 molar sodium hydroxide solution. So if I have 0.01 molar um, sodium hydroxide, then uh, what this means is I'm going to have 0.01 molar sodium ions plus 0.01 molar hydroxide ions, because sodium hydroxide is going to split up into the ions. It's going to split up into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. For every sodium hydroxide, I get one sodium ion and one hydroxide. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship for each of the ions. And so this is it. I have 0.01 molar hydroxide. If I have 0.01 molar hydroxide, um, then I, I can do it by powers. 0.01 molar hydroxide is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 2 molar hydroxide. That's 0.01 molar. And then I look at the power. What is the power? The power is minus 2. If power is minus 2, then that means the pOH is the negative of that, which would be positive 2. The pOH is 2. Or I could use the mathematical equation. I could just plug it in here, and the pH is equal to the negative log of H plus. Or actually, it's wrong, OH minus. It's not here. So the pOH is 2. Now, sig figs are tricky here. Does this 2 have any sig figs? Is this significant? Will you count that as a sig fig? The two, the power. Therefore, we don't count this as significant. How I express this, this is significant. You know how many sig figs I have here? I've got one sig fig here. If I got one sig fig here, I need to show that here. The way I'm going to show that is add this 0. 0.0. This is going to be one sig fig. This two is not significant. So I got one sig fig. So if the pOH is 2, what is my pH? Well, the pH plus pOH has to add up to 14. So it's going to be 12. 
pH must be 12.0. And that means my H plus must be, well, the H plus is, that's the power, right? This is the power. And so it's going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 12 molar. This is, you got to do the opposite sign. Or we just punch it in the calculator. We can punch it in the calculator. That's what they did here. I, I, I just did this. I just um, know that the power function is the negative of the power. I, I immediately see that they made a mistake here. Do you see what the mistake is? They use just the power. It's supposed to be the negative of the power. And so the POI shouldn't be minus 2, the pH should be plus 2, or just 2. Well, they fixed it here. They got the pH correct. The pH should be 12. Mm, they didn't do the sig figs correctly, though. But <coughs> the H plus? Well, if uh, 12 is the power, right, is the power of the hydrogen, then we just plug that in as the power here. So it's 10 to the minus 12 molar. 10 to the minus 12 molar. All right, so that's another example of doing this. You can see how this goes by um, powers of 10. You know, the pH scale is by powers of 10. You can see how powers of 10 grow or shrink. You know, going from 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 2 is 10 times. 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 3 is 100 times. 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 4 is 1,000 times. Difference. So this is by powers of 10. Well, it turns out that a pH of 7 corresponds to a hydrogen ion concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molar, which is neutral. If it's close to neutral, um, we call it weak. So this would be weakly basic here. The pH is greater than 7. If the pH is less than 7, this would be weakly acidic. You have more acid than base. And then as we get closer to the ends, it becomes strongly acidic or strongly basic. And so in general, things are going to range from pH 0, strongly acidic, to a pH of 14, strongly basic. But it, it turns out that um, are pHs greater than 14 possible? Yeah? It turns out, yes, their pH is greater than 14. Can we have pHs less than 0? Is a pH less than zero possible? No. Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, pHs less than 14 are possible. Are they man-made or could they be natural? Man-made. Well, they could be natural. Like, here's a paper from 2000. Um, negative pH and extremely acidic mine water. Well, maybe it's not natural, it's mine water. From Iron Mountain, California. California, known for extreme, many extreme things. Uh, but anyway, what is the pH they found in the mine water here? Look. As low as wow. That's that's this is this is really low. pH values as low as minus three point six. That's really acidic actually. Yeah. Extreme acidic. Well, this is an interesting paper. This is the full paper's on online. Um, but when we get into extreme pHs like that, then uh, things don't behave so nicely. 
a lot of people will, will think that pH is only varied from 0 to 14, um, because that's where we do most of our calculations. When we go to negative pHs, and when we go to pHs greater than 14, then the solutions become increasingly concentrated. As the solutions become increasingly concentrated, they don't behave so ideally. And uh, we have to introduce that non kind of ideal behavior into the mathematics. So we can't use these simple equations that we've been using. The equations become a little bit more complex when we're dealing with extreme pHs. And so that's why you aren't going to see it in this slide. Since people don't see it, they think, oh, it doesn't exist. But most of the pHs that we're going to read are going to range from 0 to 14. So we have pH paper here. This is called universal uh, indicator. It's just a dye. And this dye changes color depending on the pH. This one is um, multiple dyes. So we have a rainbow of colors like this. And the dyes will change color at different pHs. Therefore, if you have different dyes in there, you can get different colors. Um, this isn't as precise as something like this. The pH meter is much more precise. You know, measure the pH of the solution is 4.32. The pH meter is good. So if we look at some of the um, substances here, you can see the range, like battery acid. Battery acid is going to have a pH close to zero. Stomach acid, very strongly acidic. Lemon juice, vinegar, black coffee, blood. Blood is, what would you call blood? Neutral, slightly basic, slightly acidic. Slightly basic or slightly acidic? Basic. Yeah, just slightly basic. pH is greater than 7 or basic, pH is less than 7 or acidic. Bleach. Um, bleach is pretty basic. Sodium hydroxide, yeah. Sodium hydroxide and water. Drink. Alright. Um, if we are dealing with integers, it's easy. So we're dealing with integers, it's just power, negative power. And so let's look at the hydrogen ion concentration. A hydrogen ion concentration is 1.0 is 10 to the 0. 10 to the 0 is just 1. The power is 0. Here, um, 0.1 is 10 to the minus 1. The power is negative power. And so if you see, this is 10 to the minus 6 molar. Power is 6. So pH is 6. This is uh, 10 to the minus 7 molar, which is neutral. Power is 7. We're going to have that. However, that only works if the coefficient is 1. You see, all these are 1, 1, 1. What if we have like 0.23 or 0.123? Then we're going to have to use a calculator. You can't just read it off. So the, the earlier calculations I just did in my head. But if, if we have something um, non-integer, that is um, not equal to 1. So it could be 2, it could be 3, it could be 2.3. Then we're going to have to use a calculator. We can't just read off the power. And so let's take a look at an example of, of this. Um, I'll just skip a couple of slides there. But let's take a look at this. Uh, Hydrogen ion concentration is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 6. If it's 1 times 10 to the minus 6, it's easy. If the hydrogen ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 6, what's the power? 6. But if we have 2.7 times 10 to the minus 6, then that means it's between 1 times 10 to the minus 6 and 1 times 10 to the minus 5. And so the pH is going to be between 5 and 6. 
where exactly is it? Well, we have to grab the calculator and uh, calculate it. And so it'd be the negative log of 2.7 times 10 to minus 6. And that gives us 5.57. And so it's about halfway between 5 and 6. That's what we see here. 5.57. This is two sig figs because the five, the first five is not significant. Okay, we have two sig figs here, 2.7. This is two sig figs in the power function. Power function, whatever is after the decimal is significant. Whatever is before the decimal is not significant. What else do we want? We want the POH. So if that's the pH, what's the pOH? Well, the pH and the pOH must add up to 14. And so the pOH is 8.43. 8.43 plus 5.57 is equal to 14. What's the hydroxide ion concentration? The hydroxide ion concentration is, you just take the, the hydroxide ion concentration, we know what the power is. And so the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to 10 to the minus 8.43 molar. But we don't leave it like that, you know, um, as 8.43, the power of 8.43. We'll have to punch this out in our calculator. Uh, calculator. Uh, when we punch this out in the calculator, we're going to get... Three point seven times ten to the minus nine molar. Three point seven times ten to the minus nine molar. All right, so you should just get familiar with uh, doing some. Calculations uh, using these equations here in your calculator. All right, that is uh, that's actually the end of chapter 17. Um, so we're going to move on here to chapter 18. We can come back to 17. Any questions pop up? If you want to look at some things. Uh, the reaction of water with water is called uh, the water equilibrium. KW is sometimes called the water equilibrium constant. And um, that's because it's a dynamic equilibrium. But you know, there are other dynamic equilibriums in addition to water, the KW one. <coughs> so let's take a look at. This chapter is divided into two parts, actually. And it should be separated into two different chapters. Uh, these are two um, separate topics. Uh, the first topic that's covered in this chapter is kinetics. Um, kinetics is how fast reactions occur. The second part of this chapter deals with thermodynamics. Thermodynamics tells us, you know, where the uh, dynamic equilibrium lies. You know, what does it favor? Does it favor products or does it favor reactants? In other words, it tells us something about the driving force for it. But just because we know the driving force doesn't mean it's going to react fast. You know? We see examples of this every day, like here. We know that the Methane and oxygen, is that a stable mixture? Methane and oxygen? No, it's, it's unstable. It's potentially explosive. Well, if it's potentially explosive, why doesn't it, it explode right now? Um, it doesn't explode right now because it's reacting very slowly. You gotta get it reacting faster. How do you get it reacting faster? 
try to speed up the kinetics. How do you speed up the kinetics? Well, one way to speed up the kinetics, kinetic <coughs> usually refers to motion. And so one way to speed up the kinetics is to heat it up. And so if I heat it up, then you've got to worry about explosions. But if it's cool, um, we're, we're OK. Well, anyway, whenever we're thinking about kinetics or reactions, we've got to think about collisions. Like in KW, I, I said out of a billion water molecules, only about four are capable of reacting. Those four that are capable of reacting will have enough kinetic energy to break the bonds. We need that. So for an individual collision to result in a reaction, the particles must have kinetic energy, enough. Most water molecules don't have enough kinetic energy. And that's the reason why most of them don't react. And they also have to have the proper orientation. So for example, in the water, plus water, the oxygen must collide with the hydrogen. If we have an oxygen colliding with an oxygen, it's not going to happen. So this is the orientation. And so this is called collision theory. Collision theory of chemical reactions. This is the name of the title of the slide. Here's a collision here. If you look at collision A, this is a successful collision. You know, we have the molecule blue and the molecule red. They collide with enough energy to break bonds, and they're in the right orientation. And so they react. So we have a blue, blue, red, red, forming blue, red, and red, blue, red, two blue, red. Here's one where they don't have enough energy. If they don't have enough energy to break the bonds, and they just bounce off. Here's one where they have enough energy, but they don't have the right orientation. And so that doesn't result in a reaction. And so collision theory says that we need the right energy and we need the right <coughs> orientation for things to happen. This is how we map things out in collision theory. We look at one collision at a time. And so here, we're looking at this collision, the blue and the red molecules colliding. And so this diagram is called a reaction progress diagram, or transition state complex reaction progress diagram. In other words, what we have here are reactants. Over here on the right, we have products. And so how do we get from reactants to products? In order to go from reactants to products, there has to be a collision. What two things have to be in place for the collision to be successful? One, the collision has to have enough energy. The amount of energy that's required is shown by this hump. Okay, this is the amount of energy that's required to get them to react. In other words, we've got to break bonds and form new bonds. And two, we have to have the right orientation. And so here, in, in this case, this will be a successful collision. So the molecules come here and collide. At the top of this is this. At the top of this is called the transition state complex. This transition state complex is this thing. This thing is like transitioning from reactant to product. This thing we can't isolate necessarily, you know, because what's happening here are bonds are breaking, new bonds are forming. And so um, this is here, and then uh, we have a choice. We can fall down to the right, or we can fall down to the left. If we fall down to the right, then we form product. If we fall back down to the left, then we're back to the reaction. So that's right at the top. And so this is like um, methane and oxygen. We know that the reaction of methane and oxygen should be downhill, because CO2 and water is much more stable than methane and oxygen, but it just doesn't roll downhill, right? What has to happen is it has to roll uphill a little bit and then drop downhill. Now that rolling uphill a little bit means we have to add a little bit of energy to this in the form of a match or a hot surface. Otherwise we can't get the methane to ignite because we don't get enough methane and oxygen to roll uphill. But if we speed things up, then we're going to get enough get up there. Yeah. 
All right, so E sub A, is, that's called the um, activation energy, and that's the barrier, that's the hill here that we have to climb. And so it doesn't, you know, methane and oxygen doesn't react quickly because of that activation energy here. We have an activation energy to climb in the forward direction, and we have an activation energy to climb in the reverse direction here. And then we have delta E. Delta E is, is it an exothermic reaction or endothermic? In this particular instance, it's an exothermic reaction. Even though we have endothermic right at the beginning, overall it's exothermic because we release more energy than what's required uh, to activate it. <coughs> All right, if we um, understand this, then we can make some predictions about what um, things speed up reactions. You know, how can we speed up a reaction? Do you recognize this graph? Have you seen this graph before? I mean, take a look at it and see if you can remember seeing something like this in the past. I'll be right So do you recognize it? <laughs> no. That's the uh, kinetic energy distribution curve. So if you look at the blue line, the blue line would be like water. Do all water molecules at 25 degrees C have the same energy? No, instead what we see is a population distribution that looks like this. Most of the water molecules will have an energy around here. A small fraction of water molecules will have an energy here. So let's say this is one billion in population. If this is one billion in population, then there are going to be about four water molecules out in this high energy region that can collide with enough energy to react to form hydronium and hydroxide. But the bulk of them can't. Um, we can change this distribution by heating it. One thing is, we, if we heat it from 25 to 75, what that's going to do is it's going to shift the population to higher energy. If it shifts the population to higher, ener higher energy, then there are going to be more water molecules that have enough energy. And so that Kw is only valid at 25 degrees C. At higher temperatures, K gets bigger. At lower temperature, K gets smaller. So. Well, I'm going to stop here for, we take a break, um, but I'll pass it back here at test. Okay.